Good afternoon, good morning, everyone, wherever you are joining in today from. My name is Charlene Margo, and I am the founder of the Parent Education Series and co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture. We are delighted to have with us today, Dr. Dave Anderson from Child Mind Institute for a very important topic, put the oxygen mask on yourself, parent stress management strategies that work for the entire families. If you would like Spanish interpretation today, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see a globe icon. Look for the circle and click on Spanish. Others of you can click on English or if your audio works fine, you can just let it be. So again, with almost 250 registered attendees today, we know this is a really important topic. It seems like Friday before spring break for many of you is the perfect time to do this. So we're just so excited to bring this program to you. Um, Cynthia Hinestrosa is our Spanish interpreter. We are committed to inclusive education, so very glad to have that offering today. This presentation is sponsored by the Sequoia Healthcare District. So special thanks to Dr. Karen Lee and her team for making this presentation possible. We would like to also thank the Parent Venture Nonprofit for our partnership. So today, Dr. Anderson is going to be speaking for about 40, 45 minutes, and then that will be followed by about 15 minutes of Q&A with you, the audience. Today, feel free to use the chat button to talk to each other, to talk to us, to share comments. My parent venture partner, Bev Hartman, will also be sharing relevant links in the chat, so look for that. We would like you to put your questions in the Q&A button, and please keep them kind of brief and as general as you can so that we can get to as many of your questions as possible. At the end of this program, you'll also see a link to a very short survey. We really hope you will take two minutes to fill that in. It helps us for future planning. We promise we read every one, and we also welcome your comments and suggestions for future events. Today's event is being recorded and will be available on our video library, which is our YouTube channel. <clears throat> if you subscribe to our newsletter, you should have that link. So again, Thank you. And let me tell you a little bit about today's keynote presenter. Dave Anderson, PhD, is the Vice President of School and Community Programs Team at the Child Mind Institute. Dr. Anderson specializes in evaluating and treating children and adolescents with ADHD and behavior disorders. And he also has a broad experience with anxiety <clears throat> and mood disorders. His expertise includes cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, behavioral parent training, school-based consultation, and classroom behavioral support. Dr. Anderson is devoted to ensuring that patients receive innovative, cutting-edge care tailored to each family's specific needs. He gives frequent lectures for policymakers, parents, teachers, and schools on topics such as behavior management, ADHD treatment, sibling conflict, work-life balance, anxiety disorders, and challenges in foster care and adoption. Dr. Anderson earned a BA in psychological and brain sciences from Dartmouth College and his PhD in clinical psychology from Columbia University. Please join me in a really warm virtual welcome for Dr. Dave Anderson. Take it away, Dave. Thank you. Uh, hi all, and, and just to add to Charlene's fantastic introduction, uh, you know, for those of you who are looking for more context into my work and uh, into where I'm presenting from at the moment, I do direct our school and community programs, which partners with about uh, 200 public schools in any given year, uh, a bit more in this particular pandemic year uh, in New York and San Francisco, where the Child Mind Institute's offices are located. Uh, and this is programs that have reached about 50,000 students, parents, and educators over the course of about the last eight years. And uh, just to be really real, I'm presenting from my wife's deserted office building with an ancient air conditioner behind me. I have two children under five and the heat in this office building, even though it's 60 degrees in Connecticut has not turned off. So I'm currently working to have the air conditioner compensate for the heat while uh, also trying to keep my temperature kind of regulated. So, you know, I'm living a lot of the stuff that we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen here uh, and I'm gonna go to the uh, PowerPoint slides that I've prepared for today, uh, which I think I'll be able to get up here. If I can get it to share. Of course, in this moment, it decides to ver verify Microsoft Outlook, but doesn't need to. All right. So, uh, 
just to begin, you know, I, I've already mentioned the Child Mind Institute, but to, to let you know about a little bit more about where I work, uh, we have offices in New York and San Francisco. Uh, we focus on three major pillars, uh, research, clinical care, and public education. My team uh, actually draws from all three of those pillars where we do uh, research and outcomes tracking on all of the school-based services we provide. Uh, we provide clinical care within school settings as well as a social emotional curriculum, uh, K to 12 and uh, parents and educator talks. And then of course, also we are uh, very much involved in the public education uh, facet of Child Mind's mission in trying to get information to parents and educators across the country uh, about how to support themselves and the children, teens and others in their lives. Uh, this is the way I start almost every talk to parents right now. Uh, you are likely making an immense amount of effort already. If you are at this talk, uh, those of you who've uh, you know, been attending, it means that uh, you're trying to do something good for your own mental health or your own stress management or learn some skills that you're also planning on passing to your family. There's a concept in psychology that was championed by a psychologist named Winnicott of doing good enough or having good enough parenting or uh, good enough intervention by the therapist. And I wanna be clear that in a presentation like this, I'm gonna present a number of stress management skills. Uh, the object is not to learn all of them, to start doing all of them all at once, uh, to beat yourself up if you're not doing any of them. It is not to be perfect at doing this or to be the best student of stress management that has ever lived. It is literally that with a talk like this, what I hope people come away with is perhaps one goal they can set for themselves around their own stress management and how they will uh, make an effort around that in the future, having a great level of self-compassion should they not be able to succeed with all those things they're juggling, and then at the same time, keep the presentation or their screenshots of the slides or whatever it might be to go back to some of the other skills to maybe add them in over time as they find themselves having increased bandwidth or perhaps, one hopes, lower stress levels. So with that, this is the other kind of slide that's focused on validating those of you who are already attending for what you're trying to do. We've included this slide since the beginning of the pandemic and even long before that in trying to help people to think through all the things they're already doing. Because we as humans are fantastic negative behavior detectors. We you know, th think to ourselves what our family or colleagues or others are not doing, and that tends to be a lot of what we think about. And similarly, when we judge ourselves, we think about what we're not doing, or where we feel like we're falling short. And so we try to remind as an affirmation, everyone that you are likely already taking care of your family. Uh, if you work outside the home, you're likely trying to balance work and family responsibilities. You're trying to manage your own emotions. You're helping your own kid or kids manage theirs. And then of course, it's the middle of a, a pandemic that doesn't have a really clear end to it in the sense that we're still dealing with stress, instability, uncertainty, where even a month ago, it might not have looked like California and New York were gonna begin a reopening process uh, like they are right now. Vaccines might not have looked like they do at the moment. Um, and yet still there's a lot of questions about how this proceeds and what it looks like. And that's causing a rise in stress for most of the population. So with that, you know, as we embark on this presentation, I want to again take a mindful moment just to say, think about all that you are doing and the fact that if you're going to glean anything from the presentation today, it is taking one small step in the direction of your own wellness with the idea that some of the other skills that I go through over the course of the next 30 minutes uh, are things that you can add in incrementally over time and be in the midst of being gentle with yourself. So here's the first part. Whenever we start with any patient or any audience in terms of thinking about stress management, we always start with the floorboards of a wellness check-in. So this is even before we teach anybody psychological skills. And I say this to patients all the time. If we're not focused on maximizing some of the things on this list uh, before we even get into what psychology has to teach us about stress and the brain and our mental health, uh, we're really just kind of going into this already uh, not able to, to bring ourselves to it fully. So we start off with people and we say, look, let's just start with your health first. What are the public health practices you're attempting to abide by? What are the guidelines you have? Where do you feel like you've placed limitations at the moment due to the pandemic on your life? But we wanna know kind of what the matrix is within which we're trying to function and what kind of precautions we need to take because that, that figures in uh, hugely to the kinds of steps that people can take around their wellness. And actually a few of the questions that Charlene forwarded me that you had submitted before this talk uh, relate to that in the sense that there's a sort of a sense of foreclosed possibilities for stress management in the pandemic. And that doesn't necessarily mean there's any sense of doom and gloom. It's just that 
we want to make sure that we understand what people's landscape might look like. The next thing is this, getting sleep, getting exercise, uh, eating well and hydrating are not a treatment for any mental health disorder, but everyone's mental health gets better when they focus on those things. And then at the same time, everyone's mental health gets worse when they're not focused on those things. So one of the things we start off with with people is we say, look, it isn't even you know, a matter of psychologists or social workers or mental health professionals utilizing what we know from the science of mental health. Let's just start with the basics. How much sleep is someone getting? Can we do anything to tweak that? That's not even the skills that I'm about to uh, you know, go through in the rest of this presentation. It's that if someone tells us, I know from experience that I need six and a half hours sleep a night, but I'm only getting that three nights a week, our answer is there's only so much I can do in teaching you mindfulness skills if you're already not sleeping. You know, let's focus on that piece and how we get you a little bit more sleep. Similarly, if someone says, I really, you know, I, I don't have an opportunity to move my body in any given week. You know, I got to think about this. I have to think about uh, you know, how I'm going to get exercise, whether it's with my kids or without, or what I'm going to sacrifice to do it. You know, we need to, to exercise in order to just kind of have the floorboards of basic wellness. And finally, if someone says, I'm often skipping meals, or I feel like I'm not eating as well as I could, or you know, I, I commonly have things that I feel like I need to avoid due to either dietary restrictions or allergies, but I find that then it makes it difficult to eat regularly or make sure that I, I'm getting the nutrition I need. You know, again, that's what we have to focus on. Because if, if we're not making sure that we as humans are hydrated, uh, you know, getting food, uh, exercise, and sleep, it can be really difficult to be well in any sense. Uh, another thing that we talk about that's a real, real focus of wellness check-in during the pandemic is that we want to be aware of the news. We want to be aware of any changes in terms of uh, public health measures or, or ways that uh, schools might be reopening or any number of things that might affect our family. But at a certain point, there's a law of diminishing returns about news exposure. And we know for many adults, the, the more news they're consuming, the more likely they are to perhaps start feeling like they're more stressed. And so we try to help people to think, how are you getting the information you need right now while at the same time not overloading yourself? The next thing we talked about since the beginning of the pandemic, whether your child's school is remote or you are attending, your child is attending in person, um, whether you, know, you have activities or live in a state where sports are open or uh, you know, restaurants are open or whether they are not, we always try to think, given what we have available to us, how can we make it so that there's some structure in our schedule, either at work or with our family? And how can we make it so the days look slightly different? Because one of the major effects of the pandemic that has an impact on wellness is the idea that days kind of flow together and look sort of identical. And, and really what helps us to feel like we're living real life is to make it so days look slightly different or slightly more structured. Uh, the next thing we consider with people as wellness check is safe social contact. So it's whatever kinds of practices people are needing to engage in for their health or managing their level of risk, we want to consider the fact that social contact, as we are social beings, is incredibly uh, uh, promoting of wellness. And even if it's something where you can only conduct it over Zoom, far too few people are experiencing such Zoom fatigue that they may not you know, even be optimistic about how much seeing a friend over Zoom might feel different than the time they're spending at work, for example, on Zoom. We do a lot of that work with uh, patients and families. So those are the basic floorboards. Now what we try to move into is once we've done some assessment of those things, and, and oftentimes you know, with patients, we'll spend a couple of weeks really trying to focus on these before we ever get into the kinds of skills that we would teach someone in therapy for stress management. But once we've got those things, now we move into the kinds of stress management skills that we as mental health professionals try to help parents to figure out how they can work into their life in manageable ways. So the way that stress management skills are framed is through uh, the lens of the cognitive behavioral triangle. It's that when we think about the factors that contribute to wellness, it's that you have the relationships in your life, you have the family life that all of this triangle is kind of situated in, your family history, your relationship history, the way you interact with others, your family structure. But what it comes down to internally for every human being is they have the feelings that they feel, the thoughts that they experience, the inner monologue and the way they talk to themselves about the experiences they're having, the way they interpret this through the lens of their own experience, and then the ways that they behave. And a lot of our interventions for stress management are focused on one vertex of this triangle, modifying thoughts, trying to be able to get, get better in touch with emotions and think more about how we uh, either 
uh, accept them or cope with them in more active ways. And then also think about how we change our behavior to maximize wellness. So, you know, as an example of one, one place that we start, we start with this bottom right vertex. We say, okay, first couple of weeks of cognitive behavioral therapy, what we're gonna focus on is monitoring emotions. We're gonna focus on getting you in better touch with the data that you need to have for yourself around your feelings. The reason for that, and I'll talk about what's on this slide in a second, is that far too, far too many adults living busy lives, whether uh, you know, they're spending all day with their kids, whether they're dividing some time between work and spending time with their family, uh, or even whether they're, they may be uh, at work much of the day and, and only seeing their family kind of at the, the bookends of the day. The reality is that most of us move through the day experiencing waves of emotion, but very rarely stopping to reflect on them or think about the information they're giving us. Because you know, the thought is that emotions that are uh, negatively kind of valenced are nuisances. Like if we say to ourselves, like we're feeling you know, tired or we're feeling uh, you know, irritated or frustrated, we'll think of that as something that we need to deal with or push aside or get out of the way. And then feelings that we're seeking like fulfillment, happiness, uh, joy, um, you know, sense of accomplishment, things like that are feelings that we're striving toward. And, and really what we want people to do oftentimes in thinking about how they manage their stress is the first step is getting in better touch with what you're feeling throughout the day, how you understand the waves that wash in and wash out of emotions that you feel, and also how you understand yourself in relation to them. That you know, when, you, when you have very intense emotions, you know, what kinds of thoughts occur to someone around those intense emotions? Is it, I have to escape from this, or I've got to figure out a way to stop this, or I'm going to lose control, or how long am I going to feel like this, or how do I keep this feeling for as long as I possibly can? And so what we try to do is say, okay, what we're gonna to try to do is be a little bit more present with that ocean right now. And the way that we teach people that skill, is we say, okay, you're gonna start off doing simple emotion monitoring exercises. So we do one of two things. We say to somebody, we're gonna set reminders on your phone uh, throughout the day where you're gonna check in with yourself at certain points about what the situation was that you were in, what emotions you were feeling. And of course, we can all feel multiple emotions in the moment. We teach kids and adolescents that there, there often is more than one emotion you're feeling and that emotions aren't just discrete entities where you only feel one at a time. And then we try to rate the intensity of it. And when we teach this kind of skill, you know, it can be that someone you know, sits down out of convenience or they think about sitting down whenever they feel like their emotions are particularly intense. But what people do is they start to gather a set of data that they might not otherwise have really been in touch with. They start noticing their own patterns. They start noticing triggers for certain emotions. They start noticing which emotions they bring from one situation to another in the sense that especially during the pandemic, when, for example, with people working from home more than ever, the boundaries of work and family are completely blurred. We watch people even more than they ever have take the emotions from work into their family and the emotions from their family into work, partly because there's no car ride, train ride, bus ride, or walk you know, to, to kind of make a, a distinction or a boundary between those things. One other thing that we highlight in emotion monitoring is that there are culturally loaded ways of experiencing emotions, which may not necessarily involve this cerebral exercise of assigning an emotion word to it, but may just be about physiological responses in the body, how you feel, where you experience it, or seeing it even through a faith-based lens. So in that sense, what we try to figure out is what is someone's you know, kind of way of describing the way that they experience emotion, and then with whatever kind of you know, heuristic they're using for that experience, how do we get them to build more data about what they're experiencing throughout the day? And that's often the first step is that, okay, we've, we've now taken these skills. We've said, okay, if we're gonna manage stress, let's first start off with your sleep, with your eating, with your hydration and, and with your exercise and see, you know, where we feel like there are some gaps there. And we'll get in more in the behavioral and goal setting uh, module here into what we do around some of those things. But we try to take that inventory of where someone's social relationships are, you know, what, what their health status is and what precautions they're taking, and then these kinds of floorboards. Then the next piece is, all right, we're going to get them some data on what emotions they're feeling throughout the day. We're not going to do anything with it yet, but we're going to be able to figure out where are the high stress points, where are the moments you felt great joy or fulfillment, you know, is there some of that happening during the day, or is it something where, you know, it's, it's often a, a kind of, you know, layer of stress over everything. Once we've got that data, the next thing we go to, as some of you may remember, is that top vertex in the triangle. We say, okay, now we're going to take a look at your thoughts, the way you talk yourself through your experiences 
internally. And what we highlight for people is this, your thoughts are not facts. Even though you may have thought this same way your entire life, the fact is that thoughts are learned. The way that you interpret situations in their automaticity is based on what people have said to you in your earliest experiences in life, what people have taught you about other people's motivations, and what people have told you about yourself and then what you've internalized. So commonly what people have is that in moments of stress, or when their emotions are running high, they, they tend to fall into certain thinking patterns that can be very negative or can be very self-critical or can kind of entirely move away from the evidence that they might have in front of them that might cause them to have a different interpretation of a situation. And that different interpretation can make all the difference because what we're looking at with a cognitive triangle is something we call chaining. It's that we have an event like COVID-19 disrupting family norms and demanding these new systems from us and interacting with our kids. And what we see from people is that, you know, commonly when these events happen, you know, all of a sudden our mind runs in a certain direction. This is going to be a disaster. I can't do this. Now, importantly, we're not saying to people that it's wrong for you to have this thought. Believe me, the event that I'm talking about right here, this is a really common thought and it's completely understandable. And we want to have a lot of empathy for people who are thinking in this manner. They maybe think it's going to be a disaster for any number of reasons, that they may not be able to, uh, you know, function as well for their family, be the kind of parent they want to be those types of things. When we think about the emotions we experience, we'd say to somebody, having that thought, what do you think is the emotion and the intensity that you might experience? And someone said to me early in the pandemic, I feel like I'm anxious at like a level of 10, because I have no idea how this is going to turn out. And I'm hopeless at the level of 10, because I just, I don't know what I'm going to be doing. I can't, I can't seem to wrap my head around, you know, what it, what it means to be a parent or, or define this new identity for myself in the midst of all of this. And then the thing is, what, what that parent said was that what, that what that does to me behaviorally is that I assume that there's just no point in even trying, and I check out. And I say to myself, you know what, my partner can do this. Uh, you know, maybe they'll be able to be parenting better. Maybe I'll uh, focus on other things, or uh, I just uh, I can't deal with it right now. I have, to, I have to do other things. What we try to do is we try to get people to change their thinking patterns in certain ways that we know are indicative of good coping and stress management. In the sense that we know this is going to be hard, but if we can get somebody to be thinking about what's right in front of their face, I'm just going to start with something small and do my best. That's all I can do. I often tell people that my coping thought, uh, you know, when I felt overwhelmed by work at any point through my schooling was always, I'm just going to sit my butt in this chair for a certain number of hours and whatever I get done, I get done. And that's, that's going to be it. And that was all I could think of, because if I really thought about whether or not I was going to have to pull an all-nighter for this paper or, you know, finish this particular thing, it was overwhelming to me. And I'd, I'd be pushed into kind of a pattern of avoidance. But if I just thought about what was right in front of my face, which is all I can do is park myself here, it got me to start thinking incrementally. I'm just going to start with something small. When you get people to start thinking incrementally, they tend to adjust the way that they rate their emotion and their intensity. Their anxiety may decrease, their hopelessness may decrease. And you also see a different uh, kind of behavioral response in the sense that they may be more able to generate some new ideas or increase their own forgiveness of themselves and self-compassion in saying, all right, I know it's gonna be hard, but honestly, what other parent do I know has ever tried to parent you know, during the pandemic? Like, there's not exactly a roadmap for this. So why don't I tell myself I'm likely to be good enough and I'm just gonna start with tomorrow. So, you know, as we think about those thoughts, what we often tell people is that, you know, you want to be on the lookout for when your thinking might be falling into a thinking trap. Now, importantly, for those of you who wonder about these thinking traps, there are moments where we tell uh, patients, you're not falling into a thinking trap, this is for real. Like, for example, if somebody tells us, I really failed at work, and then in telling us the story, it sounds like, yes, they really did do a terrible job on that project. We're not just telling them, hey, listen, you're falling into a thinking trap. Like your boss probably liked it better than, you know, they said when they told you very directly that was poor work and I don't think that was, you know, a good job on the project. But what we try to think about is how can we make it so that people see the distinction between the moments when they're thinking this negatively and it's a trap. It's something that's not based on all the evidence they have in front of them. Where they say like, you know, in, in the case of black and white thinking, it's more that it's all or nothing. It's that you're either a great parent during the pandemic or you're a terrible one. And the reality is there's a lot of shades of gray in the middle or your fortune telling. You're thinking about how badly things are gonna turn out when in reality, you know, it's sort of like meteorology. Meteorologists are fantastic at predicting the weather for tomorrow, which by the way, some of the data shows that the best prediction of the weather for tomorrow, if you wanna to be a meteorologist, just predict the weather from today. 
but they're great at predicting, you know, just a few hours in the future, but they may not be able to predict with any sort of reliability what's a week out outside of these big weather events or big storms. So in that sense, fortune telling for humans is completely unreliable, but we all think based on our experience, we're much better at it than we might actually be. Ignoring the positive. So it's the kind of thing where, you know, commonly you can have a, a kid, uh, and I, I've had this many times throughout the pandemic where, you know, my partner and I, we have to remind each other, you know, to not ignore the positive, where it's like, you know, one of our kids had a tantrum at dinner over what was being served. The rest of the day has been wonderful. You know, she had a great time having a little picnic outside with our one and a half year old, you know, our four and a half year old had a great little walk with us. But because somebody didn't like the corn at dinner, we're thinking that somehow the day was bad. And we want to be able to take kind of some appreciation of the positive wins that we have. And similarly, you know, there's labeling, which is very, very similar in many ways to the thinking trap of black and white thinking. But it's this kind of thing where we take all of our experiences and we label either ourselves or the experience as good or bad, or that we ourselves are just not capable as a human being of doing this particular thing. I'll frequently give the example for labeling of like high school students who fail a math test and their answer to me is they say, well, I suck. I suck at math and I'm always gonna suck at math. And I say, okay, so I'm always gonna suck at math is fortune telling. I suck at math is labeling. And then I suck is even worse labeling. Let's consider the evidence. And then when we consider the evidence, we see, okay, you got a B on the last two math tests. This one you didn't do so well on, but also you forgot to study unit three for this math test because you didn't realize it was gonna be on it. So there may be some situational factors that make it so our label is not as accurate a thinking trap here. Again, some other thinking traps we see people fall into are taking things personally, uh, where we blame th ourselves for things that are not our fault, uh, in the sense that there are lots of things that parents will see happen with kids where they'll say, oh my gosh, this is my fault that this happened. Uh, one example is during the pandemic, uh, you know, my, my four and a half year old, he, uh, he actually was coming down to say good night while I was doing dishes. Uh, and my wife was doing kind of uh, books before sleep. And uh, he fell down the stairs and really bruised a, a good bit of his face. And I, I was convinced that, you know, for some reason, the way that I'd constructed safety measures on the stairs for days had been the cause of this incident, when in reality, I had very little control. But good Lord, I was in a blaming spiral for a number of days, every time I saw that bruise on his face, thinking, why couldn't I protect my kid from, you know, slipping on the stairs even a little bit once in his life. Uh, we've got the worst possible outcome, which is when we, we predict the worst and feel like then that means there's not even a reason for us to try coping. And then mind reading, which is one of the toughest thinking traps and the one I always end on, which is that based on our past relationships, we all have a very inflated level of confidence uh, in what we know of other people's motivations. Uh, and in reality, we're very good oftentimes at knowing our own motivations and projecting them onto other people to be a little psychodynamic about it. We're not that great at always knowing what someone else thinks, uh, whether it even be a, a partner that we've been with for years, a kid that we've you know, grown up or, or basically uh, watched them since they were a small child, uh, no matter what, it's tough to uh, tell what, what's running through someone else's head other than just having that filtered through our own lens. So again, in decreasing stress, one of the things we do around thoughts is we say, okay, how can we take this thought, figure out if it might be a thinking trap that's contributing to a large amount of stress, and then come up with a replacement thought for it, something that challenges that cognitive distortion or thinking trap in a way that leads you to a less stressed place or changes the kinds of feelings that you're feeling. And so a lot of this involves trying to figure out with people, what are your self-encouraging thoughts or mantras? What are your personal mission statements? What are the thoughts that you come back to time after time again that help get you to a better place, that reground you? And in that sense, I've just collected a few of them that we hear from parents all the time here that are very you know, common. I'm doing the best I can for my kids. I can just wake up tomorrow and try again. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. I've handled these tough situations before and can do it again. Just take this one moment as a time, at a time. And we, we really try to figure out what are people's mantras? How can they remind themselves of those coping thoughts throughout the day, whether it's a reminder that pops up on their phone, a post-it note we put on their mirror, uh, their partner reminding them of their particular coping thought, uh, if they, they're lucky enough to have a supportive relationship in that way, or even their kids, perhaps having a t-shirt that we brand with that coping thought so they're looking at it even when they're talking to their kid. So again, thinking about this plan, because we've got about 15 minutes left of the coping skills piece, it's that when we think about building out a stress management plan for any human being, we've gone from the floorboards, the, the sleep, the eating, the exercise, uh, the thinking about the, the public health measures you're taking for your safety and your kind of social contact. 
We then build upon that and think about how do we get people in better touch with their emotions and get them better data about what's going on for them throughout the day and where their stress might be high. Then we try to help them to think, how can we kind of tweak your internal monologue a little bit by oftentimes what we'll do is we'll add to that emotion monitoring chart that I showed earlier, an extra column where it'll be automatic thoughts. And we'll say, okay, so you wrote down the situation, you wrote down the feeling you were feeling, you wrote down its intensity. What were just a couple of thoughts you were having right in that situation? Maybe they take this on their phone. Sometimes we use Google Docs. Sometimes we'll have people do voice memos, but either way we'll review that with them and say, okay, this helps us to inform us as to what was fueling that spiral in that moment and how we might be able to develop replacement thoughts or mantras that get you to a better uh, place in terms of stress. Now we get really behavioral. So once we get through getting in better touch with emotions and we get through this idea of kind of the malleability of someone's internal monologue, now we get to behavioral coping. And it is that we say to people, how can we utilize what you do behaviorally to activate? This is why it's called behavioral activation. You're activating productive, de-stressing or mood boosting thoughts and feelings. And you're changing your behaviors as a way to promote your emotional wellness. So going back to the emotion data that someone collects on themselves, we'll often graph it with them and say, okay, you collected your data over the course of a day and it's not always a sine or a cosine wave as you see here. Sorry, by the way, for the uh, siren outside, but it'll, it'll pass. But you know, what we're looking for is two ways of doing behavioral activation. One is we take a look at the data and we say, are there ways that we can add in even the briefest of behaviors or coping strategies in those moments you know predictably are gonna be your troughs where you're most stressed uh, or can we add in stress reducing activities with any sort of regularity so that your baseline level of stress is, uh, or so your baseline level of wellness is higher. And so it takes more distance to get down into that trough. And we go through both of them. Like for example, right now, you know, I'm using these skills on myself where what I'm trying to figure out is, you know, recently uh, I've, I've fallen off the wagon on exercise and uh, haven't really exercised in about three weeks. And so I'm really focused on how I'm planning for a run that I'm gonna take this weekend, uh, whether it's with a kid in a stroller or not, or whether I'm just deciding to give my kid a little bit extra screen time while I run a little bit. Um, you know, I know that that exercise is gonna help with my overall baseline level. And at the same time, you know, I know that just due to a, a work schedule that is me seeing a lot of patients in any given day, I've gone away from some of my own stress management techniques. So I've made sure that next week I have at least 15 minutes in which I'm going to watch a comedy show of some sort or a YouTube video that I find funny. I often like blooper reels for sitcoms while I eat a sandwich. And I know that just spending five minutes doing that on YouTube in the middle of a work day helps to boost my mood. And I know that a run can help me on weekends. And those are just some of the smaller goals we set. When we're looking at it, what we try to do is do a behavioral inventory with people. So we say, okay, if you're going to try to boost your mood through activities, we want to come up with a large list of activities, some of which take two minutes, some of which might take 30, some of which might take two hours, and figure out what boosts your mood. And sometimes we'll just go through categories. This is a, a common kind of category uh, breakdown that I go through with people. I say, all right, what do you do for others that boost your mood? And not out of guilt and not out of duty, but what actually does boost your mood? You know, what are some fun things that you do that are available to you during the pandemic, whether it's with other people, whether it's by yourself? whether it's screen-based, whether it's sport-based, you know, what are these things? What are some social activities you like engaging in? Uh, I had a, a teenager recently who told me that, you know, he's just gotten into playing chess online with a bunch of his friends. And that's a new social activity, it's a mood booster and takes a significant amount of time. So he really likes it because he feels like it's for his brain and for his social life and for his mood. A lot, of, a lot of people during the pandemic have taken up mastery activities where we've said, look, what have you always wanted to learn as a skill? I have one particular college patient who's learning the ukulele uh, a high schooler who's learning a different language uh, that's related to her family's cultural background. And these are always things we can say, look, let's take podcasts or apps or uh, you know, the possibility of a person that you, you hire over Zoom to teach you that musical instrument. Another kid that I, I work with has taken up the guitar and uh, has really gotten into playing Guns N' Roses and like some uh, rock ballads that are like, you know, uh, really, really good for my generation. So I'm really into reviewing those with him during session as his behavioral activation. And then again, physical activity, like what, what are we doing with other people, whether it's exercise or whether it involves games that we're playing with people, uh, moving our bodies, dance parties, any number of things that might boost our mood. Uh, so, you know, we often go through and try to come up with what's a really varied kind of way of searching yourself for those things that could be inserted in two minutes, could require a little bit more time and space. 
Then we get into goal setting. And many of you have likely seen abbreviations for goal setting like SMART, where you're thinking, what can you make? How can you make a goal specific and measurable and achievable and realistic and timely? And these kinds of things. These are some of the questions we use to break that down. How can you set that goal? How can you make sure that you know what day of the week you're going to do it? I am running on Sunday. I'm running in the morning. I'm running as soon as I get up. Are there any preparations required? Yes. If I do not lay out my workout clothes Saturday night before I go to sleep, I will probably spend half the day in my pajamas with the kids and not even remember that I wanted to take a run. So bottom line is I got to talk with my partner about my plan. I'm going to do it during breakfast when the kids already have some uh, English muffins or some kick cereal because these are some of their favorites. Uh, and I am going to uh, make sure that I am in workout clothes the second I wake up. So all I got to do is put on my shoes and run out the door. Is there anything that can get in the way? Absolutely. But we're going to try to come up with some contingency plans for those things that still make it so that that happens. Maybe Monday morning before work is the contingency plan in the event that something comes up on Sunday that we know. We're going to add that one activity. And the reason why we talk about adding one activity at a time is people commonly have this bias that when they feel like conceptually they understand something, they start to get overconfident about their ability to perform it. So when I give a talk like this, people will hear the stress management strategies and they'll be like, okay, sleep, eating, hydration, exercise, set achievable goals, set one, maybe it takes a couple minutes, maybe there's another one that takes a little bit more time, monitor my emotions and change my thought patterns. I'm gonna do all of them. And, and the reality is just having that conceptual understanding is dangerous because you know, in that sense, and I'm trying to remember the Top Gun line here, but I think it's that your mind is uh, writing checks that your uh, psychology can't cash because your brain is trying to tell you I could do all of it. But the reality is that this stuff takes practice. You have practiced hundreds of times, oftentimes as a human, not doing the things that would involve caring yourself, or having caring for yourself, or having compassion for yourself, or coping with stress. So it often takes hundreds of trials to build up a new habitual pattern to actually cultivate that stress management strategy. So that's why we start with manageable goals. And then inevitably, people tell us a week in, oh my God, I didn't even get to it this week. And we say, look, right now, forgive yourself. Don't beat yourself up. This is what humans do. You know, let's move back and, and think about you know, how you're gonna be able to get to this goal perhaps next week. And with an understanding that you're juggling a lot right now. Now, the last skill that we always hit is this. So the skills I've reviewed so far are focused on kind of a, what we call the second wave of psychology. It's very active coping skills. It's the idea that you are experiencing a certain level of stress. That stress, and this is kind of the, the theoretical foundation, is in some way undesirable. Our job is to reduce it and or replace it with other uh, emotional states that are perhaps more desirable. And the way we do that is by thinking about wellness practices, getting you in touch with your emotions, thinking about how we manage your thoughts so as not to increase stress, and then thinking about how we change your behavior so as to boost your mood. It's a very active model of coping. You are doing something. At the same time, there's a reason why the serenity prayer that we know uh, related to giving me the strength to change the things that I can is so well known. It's that there's a balance, a duality in human life between what you can change, what you have the power to affect change with, and then what you uh, perhaps ride the wave of or accept or tolerate. And in that sense, the third wave of psychology, this, this uh, kind of newer and more modern wave, is focused on balancing these active coping skills with the idea of acceptance, self-compassion, and mindfulness. And, and for many people, they need all of these skills in order to effectively manage stress. So we help people to think about is the idea that maybe you know, there are some emotions that are big and intense or uncomfortable at times that you just can't change and no feeling is gonna last forever, but you know, your, your, your emotions are not throwing at you anything that you can't handle for a particular period of time. So this is where you ride the wave. Or some people also will, will highlight it as riding the urge to cope in a maladaptive way by trying to escape that thing or cope with it with something that you know is not necessarily good for you. Um, in that sense, you know, we try to give people skills for tolerating distress or mindfully kind of appreciating where they are and feeling like they can kind of ride the wave of that emotion. So when we talk about distress tolerance, distress tolerance very simply, is tolerating the stress you're experiencing and not making the situation work. So we'll go through skills with people where we try to say, okay, whether it's dependent on these active coping skills we reviewed before, or whether it's something else, you know, how can we distract ourselves in this moment while we're riding the wave of this emotion? How might we be able to focus on helping or, or being with others? Uh, how can we perhaps try to let go or nudge away those negative thoughts? 
Uh, some people use visualization exercises that involve placing the thoughts in a balloon or on a raft. Um, how can we bring about other emotions? For example, you heard me highlighting one of my coping strategies is to bring about other emotions via watching Parks and Recreation blooper reels. Um, and then similarly, we have people come up with, and we do this a lot more concretely with kids, self-soothing kits for tolerating distress with their five senses. We say, look, take an inventory of what it is that you like feeling um, in terms of tactile sense, uh, what it is you like listening to, what it is you like smelling, what it is you like tasting, what it is you like seeing. So for example, I often give people the, the example, and I, I don't do this often, but I love it when I do it. My self-soothing using the five senses is I've always loved baths. I very rarely take them, but I love them. If I do get to take a bath, I really like to listen to a little bit of Keb Mo. It's an artist that I, I really adore and, and have seen in concert and think he's a genius. Uh, and then if I can listen to Keb Mo, have a little bit of a, an aromatherapy candle, have a bath, which relates to tactile stuff, and also can look at the painting that I have from an island in Greece uh, on a wall in my bathroom. That, that puts me in a much more relaxed place, no matter how stressed I am. And that's my five senses kit that I can create right there. I rarely do it, but good Lord, when I get to that, uh, I tell myself that I'm gonna commit to doing it a lot more often than try to be forgiving when I don't necessarily make the time. The other thing about mindfulness is that, you know, taking this acceptance a step further, what psychology tries to tell people is, how can you be present in this moment? This is a John Kabat-Zinn quote above where you're paying attention on purpose to the present moment without judgment or without necessarily trying to change the flow of it. So when we cultivate mindfulness uh, strategies with folks, the, the thought is that we're not trying to actively change the particular situation. We're focusing on things like our breathing or our pulse or physical presence, being present or, or letting go of what particular things are happening. And we're trying to not judge ourselves for whatever thoughts are flowing into our head, which are flowing like a current on a creek through our mind. We're trying not to judge ourselves on whatever emotions occur and, and how those flow and wax and wane. Uh, we're trying not to think necessarily too much about the past, but if the past happens, we're accepting that that thought is occurring uh, or thoughts of the future, uh, problem solving or our self-judgment. Again, the whole point is you're not trying to focus on those things, but at the same time, you're not judging yourself should those things happen. Uh, naturally. So when we cultivate mindfulness practice, what the research has shown about this particular coping strategy is that people find that they get in better touch with their internal monologue, their thoughts. They're better in touch with their feelings, the sensations in their body. They find that they're more present with their own emotions and feeling that they're feeling them more fully or that they feel like they can ride that wave more fully knowing that they don't have to escape it. And there's this acceptance of the fact that you may not be changing anything but you are engaging in kind of either this practice when you need to, or what we hope for many people is that you're engaging in this daily as a preventative way of thinking about your own wellness. Now, commonly, and I'm gonna to move to questions in a second, so I'm not really gonna do this. I will lead people through a three minute body scan if I have the time in this moment, because frequently what I find, and I have a caseload that involves a lot of uh, adolescent males, they will tell me mindfulness has never worked for me, you know, I, I can't slow down. Uh, I need to do the active coping thing or my parents need to change. Uh, I don't really wanna just like meditate. And I'll say, look, we're gonna do a three minute body scan. You can find these on any particular app, which I've listed a few on the next page, uh, you know, on YouTube. Uh, I, I, you know, you can find these almost anywhere, but I'll lead them through say a three minute body scan. I'll say a large uh, percentage of patients fall asleep right in that moment uh, just because they've, rarely slowed down that much. And oftentimes they're adolescents and they haven't gotten too much sleep. And so slowing down actually puts them to sleep. Uh, and then at the same time, others will open their eyes at the end and say, okay, that was weird, but wow, I, I feel different. And that's a, a common experience for people. So we, we try to kind of temper the, the negativity around it with just experiential learning. So what we tell people if they're going to cultivate the skill of mindfulness, again, in building their kind of stress management plan, is to start with the very simple and manageable goal of starting a daily body scan practice, where it's not about you know, meditating or being mindful you know, outside of having some guidance to do it, but to look at perhaps an app that you can download, Headspace is another great one that uh, I haven't listed here, but you find a moment where you commit to practicing. Or we talk about kind of daily mindfulness. Like my favorite food is sushi. And one of the things that I have is a sticker uh, right in my home office desk is taste your food, what I've kind of written. And so when I actually get a lunch that I really love, 
I really focus on slowing down and actually tasting it rather than eating it while I'm reading emails or doing something else. So look, with that, what I want to say is I'm going to wrap up and move to Q&A here. But for those of you who are thinking about your personal stress management plans, what I want you to be thinking about right now is taking away kind of from what I talked about at a very quick pace here. If you're going to commit to one particular thing from this talk forward uh, for your own wellness, is it going to be you know, committing to setting some goals around your sleep, eating, hydration, or exercise? Is it going to be committing to some goal with your social contact or with your partner? Is it going to be to monitor your own emotions, to try to track when you might be falling into thinking traps and change some of the way you interpret situations? Is it going to be behavioral activation and coming up with a list of activities you might be able to pepper in in your week for stress management? Or is it going to be cultivating distress tolerance or mindfulness practices? Either way, try to start with one of them. And for those of you who want to read a book, because I often get this question on some of these strategies, the easiest, I think, starter manual, which I'm endorsing, but in no way get any money from, I would start with a book called Mind Over Mood, Mind Over Mood, which breaks down a lot of these strategies in relatable ways for life. And I'll also say our website, childmind.org, has a lot of this information on as well. So Charlene, uh, I'm ready. Let's, uh, let's do some rapid fire questions here. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Anderson. I think we all feel more capable and we'll feel more relaxed just listening to you. That was really wonderful. One hopes. Yeah. <laughs> One hopes. Exactly. Yeah. It's Friday. So um, I'm going to start with a question actually that came in from our audience, Dave, because it's just emblematic of how people are feeling and very honest. So this writer says, I feel terrible when my daughter said my breakfast smelled like grandma's feet, even though I served her eggs and ham. I feel like by the end of the week, I'm exhausted trying to keep up and I'm sad, feel like I'm not good enough and putting too much pressure on my kids. Is there such a thing as putting too much pressure on kids? Well, it's hard to delve into the uh, kind of specifics of this particular thing. And I, I feel for the, the question asker here, especially because, you know, ham and eggs is, uh, takes a lot of effort and no one deserves to be told it, it smells like grandma's feet. Not to mention, you know, if, if my grandma's feet smelled like ham and eggs, that, that would be appetizing to me. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that thinking about this question, yes, th there are definitely uh, times to put too much pressure on your kids. The vast majority of instances in which I'm asked that question, the parent is not putting too much pressure on their kids. Uh, and, you know, it's more about the parents' worries about all the things they're holding themselves to than it is the idea that they're putting too much pressure on their kids. Look, we all know that kids are going to give us some level of attitude that they may not have the sort of mental filters that suggest, as it might in the rest of society, that they should be gentle with your feelings or be considerate of the effort that went into your actions. But, you know, what we focus on with parents is this, is that oftentimes with attitude, just to take the example of that, that question, when a kid is, you know, a little bit ungrateful for their breakfast and critical of it, what I focus on with parents are kind of the things that are much more surefire wins. Well, say, look, you may not be thanked for that breakfast, even though in any other household, it would be considered, you know, fantastic. But rather than thinking about, you know, the, the expectations you're holding your kid to or the expectations for respect or gratitude that you should get, how can you cultivate joy with your child in a way that seems to balance out, you know, the, the uh, green eggs and ham facet of this, uh, you know, interaction? And, and oftentimes what we can figure out is, is kind of some of the more reliable points where a kid's not giving you feedback on your effort or you're engaging in something that might be mutually enjoyable and it helps to balance it out or make it more likely your kid actually might appreciate your efforts, you know, just in, in terms of what you're doing. The other thing that I focus on too is that we may never get that appreciation from our kids. The most common time when kids express appreciation is when they're 25 and now they really need money. So, you know, in that sense, if you're looking for gratitude from your kids, I'll often tell parents, you know, know your kids likely are gonna be eventually thankful for all the things you did for them, but Let's focus on, you know, either your support network, other parents, a partner, you know, your friends and how you can share experiences and tell each other that you appreciate the effort that you're going to. Thank you, Dave. I loved it when my kids turned to be 23 because they told me, A, all the things they'd done that I didn't know about. Yep. And they really did come back and say that they were appreciative for the parenting. So of course. good advice, parents. I know that it's true. Right. All right. This is one that I think a lot of people feel parent rights. I have tried meditating, but I can't sit still for five minutes, let alone 20. Yeah. Does exercise or walking the dog count as mindful activities? 
We, we get that asked that a lot. So think about what's behind that question. It's, am I doing it right? The answer is usually yes. Because if you are trying to be more present in your experience and trying to you know, more deeply appreciate and keep yourself in that moment around something that you might enjoy, that is the essence of mindfulness. So if someone says, I need to walk the dog and I, I just suddenly am like kind of focused on like, okay, what are some of the signs of spring I see outside? Or how can I be a little bit more focused on like the fact that my dog is so funny and not just about like when they're gonna go to the bathroom or something like that. We are trying to cultivate like the mindful aspects you can appreciate in that moment. That is the essence of mindfulness. We don't want people to think that the only way that mindfulness exists is if you are on some uh, mountaintop, you know, in the lotus position, uh, meditating uh, as much as you can. That's just, that's one form of mindfulness that can be transformative for some people. Thank you. That is great advice. We'll remember that when we walk the dog. Indeed. All right. Here's another one. I like this question. With everyone home together for distance learning, it's hard to manage family dynamics and emotional upsets. I know you address emotion. I've even lost my tempers at time, my temper at time, and I'm not proud of that. What do you suggest? I mean, the, the thing is, managing someone's frustration level and their, their temper at an increased level of family conflict often entails really systemic focus. So, you know, people will often ask, like, what do I do in this moment where I lost it? And our answer is what matters so much more is what you do in the moments where you're not losing it. Like, we want people to forgive themselves for the fact they're stressed at the moment. And for one reason or another, we know that parents are going to lose it, or they're going to get really frustrated, or they're going to get really mad at certain points. It's how can we chip away at the idea that your cup is already running over before you get in those situations? So we're trying to think through with people, what is your systemic wellness plan? What are you committing to around, you know, some of the things that are going on in your family, either around wellness practices you can take charge of, things that you can perhaps, you know, uh, think about focusing on with your kids. Like, I can't tell you the number of times where we see increased family conflict in the pandemic, where we've said to people, you know, what do you want your kids to do? And they'll give us a list of, you know, 18 things. We'll say, great, but let's really assess where you are. They're not doing any of those 18. So we're not gonna go zero to 60 all at once. You know, we're not gonna get them to do all 18 things all at once. And most parents say to us, well, why not? I thought you had some magic wand you could, you know, wave and then my kids would just do all these things. We would say, no, there's no way to both have a relationship with somebody and get them to completely overhaul their behavior all at once. You do it incrementally. So we get parents to figure out how can they utilize the relationship they have within their family to not only do things for themselves, but also get their kids to do something. And just one example of that is I have a, a mother of an adolescent uh, a female who you know, said uh, she had a whole laundry list of things she wanted her daughter to be doing during the pandemic because they're, they're getting closer and closer to graduating from high school and she's feeling all this pressure to be able to launch her daughter into adulthood. And she said, honestly, all I want to do is get out of the house once a day and exercise. And we just focused on that. We focused on how they could exercise together, how she could get her to get out of the house, uh, how if she doesn't get out of the house, maybe it means that she's uh, walking to uh, pick up dinner in a, a COVID safe way. You know, any number of things that we can do just to get bodies moving in some way. And when you focus on that, oddly enough, moods improved. There was less of a focus on the idea that the parent was a taskmaster. And there was more of a focus on both people's wellness and, and kind of what they were doing. So again, that's just a, a snapshot of some of the things we do in those situations. That's really great. Great advice, parents. And listen to that. Dr. Anderson suggesting to do things incrementally to take baby steps and set one manageable goal at a time. Really good advice. And the same so, for the kids. But same yes. for the kids, exactly. So the, here's the question related to that. Yeah. Parent asks, how can we support our kids in managing their stress, especially younger kids and preteens who are already going through a very stressful time? Right. So in terms of helping kids manage their stress, there's a three-step process for any human being to learn a new skill. It's that someone models that skill, someone explicitly tells them what the skill is, and then someone catches them being good doing any approximation of that skill. That's how we learn everything. So in that sense, you know, if you're trying to teach a human being emotion regulation, they have to see other human beings regulating their emotion. They have to see those human beings explicitly talking about what they're doing to regulate their emotions. And then that person, that role model, needs to catch them doing that thing. So we'll say to parents, you know, what you want to talk about is like, okay, 
you tell your kid, even at young ages, I'm a bit stressed for the work day that I'm about to have, you know, I'm about to go upstairs or, or you know, to the, the, the other room that I'm in and, and have to jump into a meeting that I don't feel that prepared for. But you know what I'm going to do right now? So I'm going to try to get myself a good breakfast. I'm going to drink a cup of coffee and I'm just going to go in there and try to, you know, give them what I've got. And it's that you're externalizing your own process for dealing with that stress. What kids love to do is then internalize what you've just shown them and what you've just made explicit, but take credit for it. Teenagers are fantastic at it. They will act like they were the ones who invented stress management and that they discovered mindfulness and meditation, even if all you've been doing for six months is telling them about how you found this you know, meditation on calm that you really love, they'll act like it was something they got from a friend or there was a di an idea that sprung from their own head. But that's the way that we learn these skills is that we've got to do them for ourselves when our kids see the effect that they have in someone they admire or just someone that is a major attachment figure in their house, not saying your kids have to admire you, but they, they often get a little bit curious about what's going on, whether or not they agree with you, they'll internalize your process. Then the key, you catch them being good. Of course, I'm, I'm expecting that parents are gonna give constructive feedback when, pay, when kids are not dealing with stress well, but the real key is when they are dealing with stress in any way, well, you catch them. You know, I was really impressed. Like, it seemed like you had a ton of homework last night. And I know you were so tired because it was a really rough day at school. But the fact that after dinner, you just got right down to it and finished that math worksheet, I was really impressed with how you managed that stress. That was really impressive to me. Like, you give that feedback and your child makes that explicit connection in their brain. That becomes easier and easier the next time. And I'll often give the example of what two of the soccer coaches I had in life and thinking about uh, how you, you uh, note skills. It's that I had a fantastic soccer coach, Gus, early on in life. He was great. When we'd come off the field at halftime, you know, he'd say, good job, lads. You know, that was fantastic. Great half. You know, you really played well. It was very nonspecific, though. We knew we were supposed to feel good, but we didn't know what. Whereas I had a coach, John, a little bit later in life, where when we would come off the field, he'd say, Anderson, I loved how you were really focusing on getting the ball out to the wing so that we then cross it in and have a bit more in the way of scoring chances. Not to mention you were fighting for every header. I would have gone out there and killed for the guy because I felt like he was watching exactly what I was doing and knew exactly what I'd put my effort in on. And I was going to reproduce those behaviors in the second half as much as I could. That is the key to human change. You can still give constructive feedback. You just got to catch people being good and appreciate their effort. I love that. And very in line with Dr. Carol Dweck's work, who says praise, but make sure that it's specific, right? Yes. I do the kind of effort. My kids and I now, they're old enough that they can call and say, I need one of your pep talks, mom. Absolutely. And then, and then they'll call and do it for me. So right. if you do it long enough, <laughs> the and, kid and what, will start doing it for you too. And what is it? The crux of what Dweck is saying is process over product. You're not saying great job scoring a goal. You're saying, I love the effort you put into fighting for every single ball. It's that you learn resilience when you praise perseverance and the effort that someone puts in, regardless of the outcome, whether they got a C or an A on that test, if they tried their best, that's what you want to reinforce. Exactly. So Dr. Anderson, we are at the end of our time here. I would like to know what parting words you would like to give parents and what most gives you hope right now? Whew, uh, two, two good questions. Look, the parting words, I think I will refer back to uh, my parting words right just prior to Q&A, which is just for anything that you've heard today, set small goals for yourself, be compassionate with yourself, reward yourself for actually achieving any of those goals. And at the same time, just keep coming back to the concepts that we're talking about today as a way of continuing to kind of go back to the well of stress management strategies one might have. Uh, in terms of uh, what gives me hope, uh, Look, you know, it's, it's the fact that uh, what I see even over the past few years, even prior to the pandemic, is a, a decision within our society to attempt to combat mental health stigma in a way that allows us to promote all of our wellness because of what we have to learn from the mental health field. And that, that gives me hope because what I feel like I've seen even over the course of the early part of my career is people going from, oh, I would never see a therapist. I don't want to listen about mental health. You only have to use this if you're broken and that there's so much stigma associated with mental health disorders to more of a, a centering within our society of the idea that mental health is health. And for that, we should all be kind of mindful of how we can promote our own wellness so that we can be our best selves for our kids and for our family and for you know, 
all, all those who are around us. So that's going to be hope. Well, thank you, Dave Anderson. Mental health is health. I think that is the perfect place to end on today. We want to thank you, everyone who joined us. Again, this video will be available on our video library soon. I know that you will want to share it with your partners and maybe even your kids and your brothers and sisters and friends. So again, thank you, Dr. Anderson, for everybody. Take care, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we hope to see you again. Bye-bye.